The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I am your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V and pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. Hello, Tom. Good to see you. You too. Father, I'd like to begin tonight by reading an email that we have had for quite some time, uh, and I'd like to see if we could address that tonight. So I'll just read the email in its entirety and then have you respond to it. Um, so it, it reads, Thank you very much for your program, Father Jenkins. I am one of the young married Catholics with young children whom you warn against attending the extraordinary form of the Mass within the Novus Ordo Church. I appreciate the lesson you put together for people like myself. I was raised in 1980s Poland where the Mass was celebrated in the vernacular, a much better translation than the English. Also, the vernacular was overlaid onto the Gregorian chant melodies. We received communion kneeling and on the tongue. The piety of the people and my family, as well as the beautiful, the beautiful and theologically sound vernacular hymns, instilled the true faith in me as a child. After moving to America, my family attended a Polish parish where the pews were always full to overflowing. The faith was vibrant, but communion was given in the hand. I know the graces I received were real and almost tangible. Over the years, I moved to attending the English Mass, when I went to a prominent Catholic university on the East Coast. At this time, piety was simply not enough to help me to live a holy life. It just seemed like the graces were not available to me. It was like trying to drink from a fountain that has run dry. I was okay continuing to attend masses that sometimes uh, offended my deepest sensibilities because, after all, Jesus was there in the Eucharist. I was there for him not to feel good. I had no idea there was such a thing as traditional Catholicism in America. I was vaguely aware of the SSPX, but my, my, my ideas of them were shaped by the Novus Ordo Church. At adoration, I was upset that my peers at school were going to adoration in order to socialize. I found this incredibly offensive. They should have been there to adore the Lord, period. Not that a church community is not important, but it was obviously clear that many, if not most, of the attendees were there to socialize. In spite of this, I was still thrilled to find Catholics who were excited about their faith and the church. I had never seen this before in the public schools in suburban Chicago or the nominally Catholic high school I attended. The young people at the university were excited and proud to be Catholic. Many of them were homeschooled. They actually had the faith. I never heard about homeschooling and immediately decided to homeschool my own children someday. Those preparing for marriage were all talking about NFP. I found this intriguing. Some years later, I met the man I would marry, and our courtship coincided with Simorum Pontificum. My future husband and I began attending a Latin Mass in our Archdiocese monthly, and I've continued to go monthly since then. The rest of the time, we attend the ordinary form. When it came time to baptize our children, however, I insisted on the extraordinary form of baptism as quickly after birth as possible. I would not take any chances with my children's salvation. Why were the exorcisms removed from the ordinary form, I wondered. Why were my children to be deprived of their inheritance? Now I feel like I am slowly beginning to wake up to the awful reality of the type of church I find myself in. This is all because of my children. Six years into a marriage and four children later, I found myself feeling embarrassed to have been so fertile while my very devout Nova Sordo friends spaced their children, quote, responsibly, all while living in constant fear of unexpected pregnancy and not exactly embracing Holy Mother poverty. Something began to feel very wrong. Isn't the vocation of marriage most fundamentally one of motherhood and fatherhood? My husband is sympathetic, but still is not convinced that there is something intrinsically wrong with the whole New Order Church. What is a woman in my situation to do? What would your advice be to me? What can I do to pass the faith on to my children? Well, those are big questions, of course. Uh, <laughs> very significant questions. And uh, thank you for writing, and thank you for giving us that background. It's very enlightening, actually. <clears throat> Being raised in 1980s Poland uh, with, uh, I guess, the Novus Ordo, perhaps even what they refer to as Eucharistic Prayer One, which they say is substantially the Roman canon, um, 
but obviously there there are changes. The Novus Ordo is a new order, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but evidently, this dear lady uh, grew up with some a real sense of piety, a real virtue of religion in her soul. And uh, whatever took place, she was trying to understand in a Catholic way. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that's one of the problems with the Novus Ordo. It, uh, the more it resembles Catholic tradition, um, <clears throat> the more it, it is deceptive in a way. Uh, it, it, I'd say it lends itself more to be interpreted in the Catholic way, but, <clears throat> but that is the whole point of modernism to deceive, uh, to um, use the same language but to mean something different, to, um, to appear Catholic as much as possible, and as much as necessary to deceive people taking steps in, into a new, different religion. You know? I mean, even the fact that this dear lady um, talks about the extraordinary form, the ordinary form, wanting her children baptized in the extraordinary form, mm -hmm. even that tells her that the fact that what she wants of the new religion is the extraordinary form. I mean, it is not the normal standard uh, form of their worship. She's looking for what they consider to be extraordinary. And what they consider extraordinary, they were trying to ban for 20 years. And they only granted as a, as a, as a, uh, a concession after 20 years of failing to, su to succeed in, in banishing it entirely. <clears throat> so this tells this dear soul, uh, it should tell this dear soul something <clears throat> that she needs to know about modernism, she needs to know about the new church. Uh, the, the purpose of this is basically to erase, <clears throat> the, to obliterate the very thing that she sees um, most precious in her, in her own, the practice of her own religion, the practice of her own faith. So she realizes that there's something gravely wrong here, obviously. You mm -hmm. know. But I gather she has the issue that her, her uh, problem that her husband, who obviously is a good man because she wouldn't have married him. I mean, this is the type of woman who marries a man who has faith and wants to do what is right and has certain love for God. And, um, but he doesn't see it quite yet. Now, I gather that he is not native Polish. I don't know. Does she say that? I'm not sure. She doesn't specify. Yeah. So I don't know if his background varies so greatly from her own. I don't know. Maybe he's an American who grew up here with a new mass and uh, has become very comfortable with it. I don't know. Um, but uh, in any case, how does she help him to appreciate the significance? How does she enable him to see what she sees? Mm -hmm. Education and, uh, and prayer, sacrifice, patience. But um, if she married a man who has a true love for God, that makes all the difference, you know? <laughs> because if she can show him that the Novus Ordo is not really about the love for God, but about the convenience of man, right? If she can show him essentially what Peter, what what uh, our Lord said of Peter in Saint Matthew chapter sixteen, after Peter had professed, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God," in Saint Matthew's Gospel, Saint Matthew's Gospel chapter sixteen, that is, <clears throat> our Lord uh, promises Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven and says, "The gates of hell shall not prevail against it." That's what we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. But what we're not familiar with that much is what comes next, you know, like immediately afterwards, is that our Lord begins to tell his apostles about his impending passion and death upon the cross. And Peter takes him aside and begins to argue with him and insist that this, these things will never happen to him. And there he is, adamantly contradicting the word of the very one he just calls the Son of God. You know? mm -hmm. And what does our Lord say to Peter? This is very instructive for us today. <clears throat> our Lord says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. The very one he just called Peter, the rock. You know. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art a scandal to me. Peter was a scandal to our Lord. Because thou, thou mindest not the things of God, but the things of man. If she can make her, her, her husband understand that this is what the new order is really all about. Then I think she will have won the day, you know, and made him see right through the mask, mm -hmm. the veneer of Catholicism, but even still remains, you know. Mm -hmm. Remember, she's seen to it that her husband is exposed 
to the most conservative side of the Novus Ordo. And because her husband is going to be exposed to the most conservative side of the Novus Ordo, he might think, boy, this is really Catholic compared to what I grew up with. If you grew up with a straight, un, un, you know, un, un, shall I say, remediated Novus Ordo, if he grew up with, this, with a bald-faced Novus Ordo, and now he's doing Catholic things, you know, <clears throat> more Catholic things than he has ever done before, he might think, wow, this is really getting really Catholic around here. But he doesn't really know what to compare this with. You know? mm -hmm. He doesn't see that relative to the true Catholic faith and the traditional Catholic religion, that what he's doing is basically Protestantism. It's like high church Anglicanism, mm -hmm. you know, almost. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, he really needs to see what the real traditional Catholic faith and the real traditional Catholic religion is, you know. So, um, she, but, so she's going to need to, to educate him, but, but the problem is here, too, she needs to educate herself about um, the, what the true church is. I mean, there's a reason why her friends are talking about NFP, natural family planning, and they space their children out, and they're always in dread of getting beginning with child and so on, <clears throat> but they don't even have the fundamental Catholic understanding of what marriage is all about. Um, even what the reproductive powers are for, you know, that make us male and female. If, if, if their friends don't even have a grasp on that, it's because they're not being taught. Mm -hmm. Or they're being taught falsely by their own priests, by their bishops, by their Novus Ordo Pope, Francis. I mean, he's misleading these people. And they're following along. And she realizes that there's a contradiction in what they're, that what they're practicing as, as Catholics and what the Catholic Church really teaches, you know. So um, she needs to educate herself better so that she can educate him. But the, f the most important thing that she can do is pray and pray and pray. She doesn't mention anywhere here praying the rosary that I recall. Mm. And this worries me, you know. I assume she prays the rosary. I assume that was standard part of, you know, Polish piety. <clears throat> Even back in 1980s Poland, mm -hmm. I imagine the, the Polish people then were taught to pray the rosary. I can't imagine giving up these private devotions, you know. And they always had a great love and, uh, and a veneration for the Blessed Mother of God. So she needs to pray the rosary. They need to pray the family rosary. And that'll bring a plethora of graces to the family. I mean, without those, without those graces, uh, no matter what external graces we receive, they cannot accomplish their purpose unless we have the internal graces enabling us to receive them mm -hmm. correctly and apply the lessons correctly. So a prayer is fundamental in this and all this. <clears throat> uh, she has to be very patient, but she has to be persevering. Um, she's concerned not only about um, making her husband understand, she needs to make her children understand. Mm -hmm. She didn't mention how old they are now. I gather they're fairly young, okay? But if she's homeschooling them, she has the opportunity to introduce the real Catholic faith to them, right. not this, this phony substitute <clears throat> uh, of a kind of watered-down, extraordinary form, mm -hmm. ordinary form mishmash. Um, so uh, I would recommend to her that she... Well, one practical thing would be to make sure they have traditional Catholic materials to read. The Lives of the Saints uh, from traditional Catholic sources. Again, not Lives of the Saints that are filtered to the modernist, uh, modernist uh, strainer of uh, you know, filtering out the miraculous, uh, putting in the natural, uh, boiling everything down, you know, to just like basic nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, like do-gooding and social work, and that's, that's what the saints were all about. Now, she can get traditional Catholic reading materials for the children. That's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they learned to learn, learn who, who the saints really are and what made them saints, you know. Not that they were just out uh, basically doing social work. Um, she can also get them traditional Catholic missiles with the entire traditional Catholic liturgy in them. And she can have them learn the prayers. She can teach the prayers. She can pray the prayers with them from the traditional Catholic missiles. And I'm talking about the 1962 missiles, okay? Um, that already have the influence of John the 23rd in them and already have changes that were made, which might not seem that significant compared to the full blown Novus Ordo. But the changes that were made were all based upon the same principles. They were made for the same reasons 
that finally gave them the Novus Ordo. Okay? So uh, <clears throat> you can't just reject the, 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 the individual tangible change saying, that doesn't seem so serious. You know, when they tell you, we're making this change because, and you realize, that's a very bad reason. Mm -hmm. And gee, that's a that's a reason that sounds very modernist, and that sounds like a reason that they they brought the Novus Ordo in. And you say, well, actually, that's true. They use the same reasons throughout. You know, they just kept making the changes for the same reasons over and over again. <clears throat> and um, and you have to reject the reasons. I mean, there are false principles at work here. So take them back to the real traditional Catholic liturgy and teach them that. Let them be exposed to that. Um, <clears throat> there are real ca traditional Catholic videos, also. I'm sure. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of bad stuff out there, and a lot of stuff that is even worse in a sense because it's deceptive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a, a, even the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light, and you got to be wary of that. Uh, certainly, in, on, the, on, the, on the internet. But there are a lot of uh, a lot of programs that could be very helpful to the children. Get them traditional Catholic catechisms. Don't accept the watered-down conservative Novus Ordo catechism. Get them traditional Catholic catechisms. Have them learn that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's another fundamental thing to be said. Praying the Rosary, learning the True Mass, and the prayers of the True Mass, learning the traditional Catholic catechism. These are all things that have got to also impress her husband eventually. And uh, what she's doing is she's not only teaching the children the truth, but she's kind of immunizing against error. Mm -hmm. It's extremely important today. Right. Um, if she can send them to a real traditional Catholic school, that would be important, eventually. But uh, she can raise them uh, as real, true Catholics in her home. Um, and I, 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 you know, I, I commend her for her desire to do what the love of God requires of her now and what the love of God requires of her children. Uh -huh. uh, the, one of the important things, too, a little caveat I'd mentioned is don't confuse them. Don't confuse the children by giving them contradictions. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them that this is right one day and this is wrong the next. Or say this is right or, and that's right, too, but they don't, they're not compatible. Mm -hmm. You know, children, even well before they reach the age of reason, they may not be able to reason things through, but when they're presented with a contradiction, they kind of have an inner sense yeah. by the time they get to be four, maybe even three years old. There's something going wrong here that's not right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the parent who, <clears throat> who scolds a child for saying mean things <clears throat> or for, for throwing a tantrum <clears throat> presents his child, even a three-year-old child with a conundrum, <laughs> when later on that same day the parent throws a tantrum and gets all upset and angry about something. And the child, again, might not be able to articulate what's wrong here, but the child knows there's something that's not quite right here. Yeah. So you have to be careful not to confuse the child. You have to be consistent in what you give them as the truth. And the consistency has to be between what you teach one day and the next, between what you teach and what you do from one day to the next. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, again, that, that's very important, too. Right. So, in any case, um, there's a lot more that could be said, and, mm -hmm. you know, I would say it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hesitate to say it, but I guess that'd be a good start. Sure. And I would appreciate a follow-up a note from this dear lady to see okay. if she sees the program. Mm -hmm. If she has some specific questions that I've just totally missed, right. overlooked, right. I'd be glad to address right. them, too. And I'd like to say, too, that any of those, uh, any of those materials that you mentioned, the catechism or the, the missal, the lives mm -hmm. of the saints, we could, uh, we could definitely get those for mm -hmm. her um, Certainly. And, and get her, get her in touch no, with those. No, that's right. Exactly. But, uh, Father, I'd like to move on to another email, which is very, very similar um, to, to this one that we just discussed. Uh, th this one's a lot shorter, but it, it deals with um, kind of a little bit more, more practical nature. Uh, of, of this same topic here. And so this viewer writes in and says, um, I watch some of your videos online and have been wondering then, what are we Catholics supposed to do? Should we walk away from Mass and all of the sacraments, even the, quote, traditional ones, since all are now ordained by non-popes, non-cardinals, or non-bishops? I'm in a state of turmoil, as you can imagine. I'm several hours away from the nearest location that you offer. What do I do in the meantime to attend Mass? I am so worried. I live in Vermont. There are no masses, no priests that I can go to who are not Novus Ordo. 
I want to go today for the uh, for the first Saturday devotions, but I am now concerned if I go, I may be committing a mortal sin. This is very distressing. Distressing. It makes me question if I am a Catholic with the confessions not being sanctioned, my wedding not being sanctioned, with masses and communions not being sanctioned. This is definitely scary. I do not know what to do. Mm-hmm. How would you respond to this? Well, that's a, you know, that's gonna tear your heart out. I mean, sure. someone is like having a crisis of conscience there. Exactly. And it's understandable with what's mm-hmm. happened, you know. <laughs> they want to do the right thing, and they don't really know what to do, what they can do. If they're in Vermont, I mean, I, I don't know how far they'd be from from Round Town. <clears throat> uh, there you find Bishop Kelly, Bishop Sante, you find the Congregation of St. Pius V, you find the Daughters of Mary there. In Round Town, New York, just across the state line, Connecticut, mm-hmm. around in Vermont. I mean, it's it's so close up there. Yeah. <clears throat> but I understand, uh, even though you know, in straight line terms, it might not seem that far. You know, it, it can be quite a trek. I understand yeah. <laughs> that. And for those who um, find it daunting to drive 50 miles, or uh, or more, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, it can be relatively morally impossible for them to do. Yeah. I would say if they can, though, if they're in a position where they can drive, even once a month, <clears throat> even just once a month, then they, they really should, for the sake of their faith, especially, this person sounds on the younger side, too. I mean, is it a, a lady or a man? Can you say that? Uh, I believe it's a woman. Okay, either way. Um, but if it's a mother or my father and there are children involved, mm-hmm. all the more important to make the extra effort to get them to Mass in the sacraments from time to time. Okay. And... Um, Otherwise, I would say, I mean, if, if if the question is, you know, about going to Mass, going to sacraments, without sanctions, so on and so forth. But the question is, are they the Mass or are they the sacraments? Mm-hmm. Uh, if they're the Novus Ordo Mass, so-called, or Lord's Supper, a memorial of the Lord, then I'd say, no, don't go, don't go. It's not the Catholic Mass. It was never intended to be a Catholic right. Mass. <laughs> so if that's the question, should she go to the Novus Ordo, it's absolutely not. It's falsifying the Catholic faith. It's falsifying Catholic worship. They sh- she should not go. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's she's talking about like an indult mass, one of these 1962 things, or some more in Pontificum, where you have somebody in the Novus Ordo who's actually offering the Novus Ordo, saying the Novus Ordo, um, <clears throat> uh, during the week or whenever, and then just kind of pops into traditional vestments to say a Latin liturgy in the 1962 rite, whatever. I, I would say... Again, no, don't do that, okay? This is just playing along with uh, the enemies of the faith. I mean, that 1962 uh, missile was allowed from, you know, 1988 when Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated bishops, and they felt they had to. Mm-hmm. Up until then, they were trying to uh, suppress it entirely. They only, the only reason why they, they yielded uh, this indult mass, so called, of the Samaran Pontificum later, later on, yes, is because they absolutely had to. Mm-hmm. They couldn't make it go away, so they thought we'll have to control it. And so it, it is very counterproductive, to say the least, to go there. I mean, and, and then on top of it, it poses all kinds of problems. Uh, is is the, the clergyman who's saying that liturgy, is he? Validly ordained was he ordained according to the new rite by a bishop, a new bishop who was consecrated according to the new rite. I mean, these things are very doubtful. Um, and um, you know, are they going to a church where they say the new mass also, and they're handing hosts out to people? And are they invalidly consecrated? But if they are validly consecrated, then what about the particles of the hosts that are falling everywhere? I mean, this is just common knowledge that this is what happens, right? That's why traditionally we use the communion plate and often the cloth and all that to be exercise those precautions. And they don't have those precautions in the Nova Sordo. Uh, they act as though they don't believe. And the, the honest truth is many of them just don't, mm-hmm. right? And those who still do believe uh, depart from the Nova Sordo to try to take precautions that the Nova Sordo does not really figure on or not allow for. Mm-hmm. Um, because it really doesn't. It's not meant to promote the Catholic faith. It is meant to undermine the Catholic faith. So, um, again, I mean, if she's saying, well, I should go to the local um, uh, 1962 Latin liturgy, no, don't go there. Mm-hmm. 
And um, I mean, there, there are many reasons not to go. Various degrees of urgency uh, not to go. I would say one of the most compelling reasons not to go is a case where the 1962 liturgy is said in a church where the Novus Ordo is said to. And um, even if one doesn't believe that the new Mass is invalid, you know, um, <clears throat> but even more so, the case if one does believe that Novus Ordo is invalid, that the hosts that are being given out during, during the Novus Ordo are just being handed out to people. You know? uh, well, some places they say, no, we're not going to give hand communion. But they do if somebody comes and puts his hand out. And the fact is, the way they treat what they believe is the Blessed Sacrament is to guaranteed sprinkle particles of the, of the hosts on the floor where you walk. And if you're going to a church where they do this, I mean, I can almost guarantee you, I can guarantee you, in fact, that when you go up to uh, receive the host, you are walking over particles of the host in the process of even getting there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, there's just no way around it. You know? It's just the fact. It's the way it is. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, and you can't say, well, if you don't see him, it doesn't count. You, know, you can close your eyes if you want to, you know, and feel your way along the pews just so you can see them. But the fact is, you know they're there. They're there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're part of the sacrilege. You know? so don't be part of the sacrilege. Uh, you cannot mix the Novus Ordo and the tradition without, without somehow committing sacrilege. Inevitably, there's going to be sacrilege. Mm -hmm. So I would say to this uh, dear soul that she should stay at home, teach her children and her, 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 within her family, Practice only the traditional Catholic faith. Do what your Catholic ancestors did before they had Catholic priests in churches all over the country. I mean, for many, many decades here in the United States of America, even before it was the United States of America, there were Catholic families who did not see a priest, except for maybe once every three months or six months or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we are in the Cincinnati area. There were times when a Catholic priest wasn't available until, I mean, but every few months, you know. And the Catholics did not say, well, i got to go somewhere. <laughs> hey, look, remember what Francis did? Remember what Francis said recently? Yeah, in northern uh, Argentina, the Catholics up there go to the Anglican services when they don't have Novus or Catholic services to go to. And when the Anglicans don't have their services, they come to the Catholic church services. Because nobody wants to be without a celebration. <clears throat> Which basically tells, and he even says that their so called congregation for the doctrine of the faith, or whatever they call it now, approves of it, it's aware of it, and sanctions this. Basically, he's telling, look, there's no real difference between the Anglican services and the Novus Ordo Catholic service, same, same thing. He's just being honest. Right. Yeah? If nothing else, however blasphemous he is, he's very honest about these things. And uh, the Novus Ordo, Liturgy and the Anglican communion service, they're, they're, they're equivalent to the same thing. Let's face it, it's reality. You know? So, um, you know, let's stop the lie and stop going along with the big lie and realize that we're in a situation, we're in missionary country again, and we just have to insist on practicing the traditional Catholic faith as far as it is possible under the circumstances today. But our ancestors and the faith would have died before they would have said, gee, you know, Father so-and-so won't be for another two weeks, and I feel like we need to celebrate something. Let's get out of the local Anglican church and have a celebration. Mm -hmm. They would have died as martyrs before they did something like that. Right. Now it's considered a virtue in the Novus Ordo. Uh, so I would just say to this lady, if you, you know, either you follow the Novus Ordo and the, and the modernism of the Novus Ordo, which obviously she doesn't want to do. Or you follow the example of the Catholic ancestors in the faith who would have given their lives and wouldn't have been dragged, wouldn't have been dragged alive into those places, you know? Mm -hmm. So if she can, I'm sure there's a way. <clears throat> Even if it's a matter of finding some traditional Catholic in the area somehow who will team up with her and drive together with her to the nearest real traditional Catholic Mass. Mm -hmm. And if it's a matter of an hour, an hour and a half drive, once a month, 
it's certainly well worth it. All right. Okay. Well, Father, I think we have time for one more short email. Again, this is in a similar vein to these two previous ones, and a lot of your, uh, you might have already covered this a lot. But this viewer writes in and says, I would like to ask about confession and spiritual direction for those who have more or less no priest to go to, or at least no, uh, no priest such as the ones who belong to the Society of St. Pius V. What is one to do in terms of seeking spiritual direction and the remedies for his sins and inclinations to sin? Is such a person still obliged to somehow make a yearly confession? And what of those who suffer from scruples, the usual remedy for which has always been blind obedience to one's confessor? Mm-hmm. Well, again, a very good question. You know, and I, I assume that this person doesn't have access to a real tradition Catholic mm-hmm. priest. And, um, I, you know... By church law, we are required to attend Mass every Sunday and Holy Day. And so. uh, there are there exceptions to ecclesiastical laws? There are. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there are. Um, you know, we we're told by the moral theologians that the church has approved that to travel an hour or more, to be required to travel an hour or more to Mass, means that it wouldn't be a mortal sin to miss the Mass. Okay? okay? But that's ecclesiastical. That's human law, and human law admits exceptions. But divine law does not admit of exceptions. So the, the church has always taught, too, that God's law says you have to do what is necessary to save your soul. And so whereas you, by ecclesiastical law, you might not be required to travel more than an hour to get to Mass on a Sunday. By God's law, you might be required to spend months, if necessary, to get to the true Mass, if it were necessary to save your soul. And so a good person like that has to decide, what, what do I need to survive spiritually, you know? And uh, they have to do whatever is necessary for that. You know, they might decide, look, I'm living here, uh, far away from the traditional Mass and traditional sacraments, and I realize my soul is in danger, and the souls of my children are in danger, my wife and so on, and I simply, I have to move. I simply have to do whatever is necessary to get to... Uh, a steady access to the traditional mass, the traditional sacraments. I mean, just have to do that, right? Um, you know, now you might even find Catholics who <clears throat> move an hour away from the traditional mass, which is kind of spiritually bad. <laughs> you wonder what are they thinking? You know, um, they distance themselves away from the traditional math, mass and sacraments, whereas they should be gravitating toward them. You know and wanting their family exposed to them all the time, and being able to attend Masses, not only when it's required by ecclesiastical law, but attend Masses as necessary to save the souls and cultivate a true Catholic piety in their children and themselves. So uh, it might be necessary for them to honestly decide, this is what I have to do, because out here I'm isolated, I'm, like living, I'm basically living on another planet spiritually, I've got to, I need access to the, to, the, to the faith and to the practice of the faith, the religion. Mm-hmm. So, um, but they might say, well, I'm alone. I don't have children to be concerned about. I have my own soul to be concerned about. And they might say, you know, the situation is such that I must be here for whatever reason. And I'm not free to simply pick up pull-up stakes and and move 500 miles, 1,000 miles away. So, um, but I still have to do whatever is necessary for the salvation of my soul. And I know my own spiritual life requires that I get to Mass at least once a month, if nothing else, at least that. And I can uh, view the Mass <clears throat> on video or whatever each, each Sunday and Holy Day, that I can't get to Mass. I'll be there with my Miss. I will pray the prayers. I'll unite myself spiritually and make a spiritual act of communion. I'll pray the Rosary every day. I mean, basic things that a person needs to survive spiritually in the world today. <clears throat> I will do spiritual reading. In other words, there are things, certain things that are within my control. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I will order my day according to those things that I know are necessary to stay in the state of grace. But I also know I need Mass in the sacraments at least once a month. And if I have to drive 300 miles to have that, I'm going to. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> now, okay, if somebody has a family, you know, four or five children and a wife, four or five children and a husband, <clears throat> they might say... I just can't pack every up and drive 300 miles each way to Mass on Sunday. But then I'd say, okay, but you have responsibility for these souls anyway. Not just your own, but for all of them. You better think about getting them close to a Mass where you don't have to drive 300 miles so that they can practice the faith. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but the individual, I could say, okay, you have the power 
to um, drive it. You can order your whole day around getting to Mass, getting the sacraments. Um, make your life that way. That, that's, a, that's what you do. Uh, find friends in the area you know who will do that with you and will support you in that. I mean, make it uh, an event uh, that is uh, for the benefit of a lot of souls. And uh, there are ways to work things out for someone who really, really is serious about doing it. Mm -hmm. They will find a way. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, spiritual direction, well, again, <clears throat> they might not have access to a confessor, but they might be able to find somebody. I mean, I, I, I hate to recommend the Internet because it's a cesspool of mm -hmm. filth. But it can be an instrument where, you know, even by email or whatever, you can contact a priest who's willing to be in touch with you and is willing to answer questions on the spiritual level of spiritual advice, you know. And uh, any traditional priest worthy of the name today is doing the work of four or five or six priests. And someone has to be very aware of that and very patient with that, okay. And if you have a priest, a traditional priest, who's kind of sitting around all day, twitting his thumbs, thinking, gee, I wish somebody would email me a spiritual question. You don't want to ask a priest like that a spiritual question because he's not taking care of souls, mm -hmm. right? It's the ones who are really, really busy. They're the ones you want to ask, okay? Mm -hmm. But there are those who are willing to do so. Um, <clears throat> some are more technologically savvy than others. I, ca I can't email my way out of a paper bag, you know? <laughs> But if it were necessary for the salvation of souls, I would find a way, at least to, to make a good effort out of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. But there, there are good priests out there. I mean, the seminary in Roundtop, for example, uh, uh, there, are, there are very good priests there, you know, who are mature beyond their years in the priesthood. And, uh, you know, I, I can't help but think that there, that there are those who would be very more than willing to help, help there, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But any traditional priest who's worthy of the name would be willing to help, sure. you know. Sure. So even if one were to, you know, press the button, send to a list or whatever, like a 50 different traditional priests around the country, I mean, there are going to be answers that come back, some of them better than others, yeah. I would think. But uh, their, their help is, is not that far away mm -hmm. for those who really want it, or a phone call. Now, the problem we have as traditional priests, uh, to, to answer 100 calls a day, if there are three, four-minute calls a day, uh, that is much more possible than answering five calls a day that are an hour apiece, mm -hmm. you know, 45 minutes apiece. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, people have to try to be, just as they would in confession, I mean, you know, you can't go into confessions when you've got a lot of people waiting there and very limited time and start telling stories or start, Oh, uh, one more thing. One more thing. Oh, how about this? You know, and start think dreaming up all these questions. That that is not right. Right. Um, it is not just. It is not charitable right, sure. for the sake of all the people there. Mm -hmm. So one has to be careful about that. But there are ways to have access and, and to get answers. A very good book of spiritual reading, which also would give a lot of hefty spiritual advice, like a spiritual director is the work by Don Lawrence Scupoli, uh, Spiritual Combat. That's an excellent book of spiritual reading. And it will give you a lot of solid answers from a master of the spiritual life that would answer questions that a lot of people have, that they would ordinarily want to ask a confessor about, mm -hmm. or a spiritual director about, but there they are in black and white, you know? And uh, there's the book Light and Peace, I think it's by Quadrupani, right? Very good book of spiritual reading. <clears throat> uh, there, uh, and the book, uh, you know, the Imitation or the Following of Christ, excellent spiritual reading. A lot of good spiritual advice in that, too. Uh, any of the books by uh, St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguori on the spiritual life. Uh, St. Francis of Sales, Treatise on the Love of God. So even those who may feel uh, isolated from a, a living, breathing priest, <clears throat> sometimes that's asking a lot to find a priest who's living and breathing and has a pulse, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, they still have access to the mind of uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori, mm -hmm. Dom Lawrence Scopoli, uh, Thomas Akempis, uh, St. Francis of Sales. That is, in, that is immeasurably valuable mm -hmm. to the spiritual life. Sure. So, um, in any case, um, I, I just recommend that uh, 
<laughs> our, our writer at least ponders some of these things and takes some practical steps. Sure, sure. And again, uh, we we could definitely uh, get them get them all all the. All we could the find things. a way to get them. We have yeah. we have a very guy fine bookstore Which, here yeah. run by a valiant woman. Yeah. Of the Book of Proverbs, a yeah. valiant woman. <laughs> Yeah. It's done a great job of amassing mm -hmm. excellent works. Definitely, definitely. And uh, I know that uh, she'd be very happy to supply mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the needs of people near and far. Right. And Father, you, you mentioned that this idea of, uh, of communicating with all of the, uh, with all of the, the technology that, that we have now. And I, I'd just like to say that the one thing I, I've, I've noticed when, when questions like this come up of there's no traditional priest in my area, what should I do, what should I do, mm -hmm. it seems that... Um, so very often the the idea of, of, of moving to a place where there is a traditional priest and a traditional mass center is so often just ruled out when I, I would say it, it a, in this this day and age when we have so much technology when there's so many options when when jobs are so flexible when there's so many work from home options when technology makes virtually in, anything anything you can dream of possible mm. I would say that that so many people could could uh, could take a better look at that idea of yeah, moving. Yeah, people think. people move for a lot less important mm -hmm. reasons than that. You know? mm -hmm. So I agree with you. Yeah, and I would say especially... Uh, and you know what? They would find that the tra real traditional Catholic community mm -hmm. will help them in every way. They, they want them. <laughs> Definitely. They, 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 they want yeah. them there. That's what I was going to say here here in the, the Cincinnati area. Um, there, there's such a strong community here, and yeah. uh, it's the the real estate market is booming, the job market is booming, so I yeah. think there's a lot of a lot of opportunity here. a lot of here. opportunity here, right? Yeah, Exactly. Definitely. We'd love to, mm -hmm. love to but, add to our ranks. Sure, yeah. <laughs> But and not only that, I mean, they have the kids would have friends, mm -hmm. and eventually spouses. Yeah. I think to choose from. So uh, that's important too. Mm -hmm. you know. Certainly, certainly. Well, let's go ahead and end there, Father. I'd like, to thank you for okay. being here tonight and answering answering all these questions oh, for you're us. You're welcome, Tom. Thank you. No problem. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.